welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be with you. Yeah, I mean, thanks so much for coming on. I mean, this is an area of wild speculation and information embargoes, and I'm really looking forward to going through some of this stuff with you. Uh, it only makes sense that the ultra-powerful organizations that run our reality would create underground installations because it offers the most security and secrecy, two things we know they hold very dear. And uh, I know you've been talking about this stuff for a long time, but give us a little overview of the information you've gathered over the years. How would you brief the people on Underground Bases 101? Well, first of all, I would say that, you know, um, the title of my, my, my last book on this topic is a big uh, giveaway. It's a huge clue. Um, hidden in plain sight beyond the X-Files. It's all right in front of us. The money to, to make these facilities is being stolen from us daily in a variety of different ways. Being, it's being sucked out of the economy, mm -hmm. out of government, out of government coffers, out of banking coffers, out of business. Literally, in stealthy ways, it's being sucked out of people's bank accounts, wallets, and purses um, by the trillions, uh, the multi-trillions of dollars. Now, this is an ongoing theft. It's a, a scam of epic proportions. There's never been anything like this in history. That's the the funding side of it has been going on for years, decades, actually. And then on the other side of it, the, the engineering to do all of this is is like science fiction. It's like something from another from another realm, another world. Mm -hmm. And yet, yet we have these facilities um, all over the place, military, non-military, and they can be extremely deep, thousands of feet deep, even one or two miles or more underground and also undersea. It's technologically feasible to make tunnels and and large facilities undersea, actually down in the bedrock beneath the seafloor. So the thing that people need to wrap their eyes around is that, that wrap their minds around is that while um, I do believe aliens and extraterrestrials exist and there's a ton of evidence that indicates they're coming here, they are here, and they're active here and have been for a long time. You don't need extraterrestrial engineering or expertise per se to build these huge, deep, sophisticated underground and or underwater facilities. Terrestrial humanity and the large engineering companies and corporations the huge civil engineering and marine engineering firms, and also the large government agencies with technical expertise um, have everything they need to make these facilities. And indeed, they are doing it and have been doing it for a long time. And it is a different reality altogether. There certainly are thousands of people involved in making, constructing, maintaining, and operating these facilities, but because of the types of programs and projects that are carried out underground and undersea in great secrecy, these people have very stringent uh, oaths, security oaths that they enter into, that mm -hmm. they sign. And so very few of them say anything, and, and it's a wonder that, to me, that anyone has spoken, and during the course of my research, I've spoken with a whole wide range gamut of individuals from the proverbial man and woman in the street right up to people right up uh, reasonably highly placed in the uh, alphabet soup mix of military industrial espionage agencies. So are there any interesting or shocking details that you've uncovered about their, the actual construction of these bases? Because I've heard that they, some of them are burrowed out by large building sized drills or connected underground by maglev tube train systems well the machinery the machinery for underground excavation and construction uh, can be extremely large and powerful uh, the tunnel boring machines themselves uh, are are mostly electrically powered and in the literature the largest diameter of the cutting face of a tunnel boring machine so-called tbms was about 55, 56 feet in diameter. 
and that's huge. Yeah. So you can imagine a, a machine that has a, a cutting face with a diameter of 55, 56 feet, the kind of horsepower, that, the sheer raw power and energy that it would take for that to grind its way through solid rock hundreds or thousands of feet beneath the surface. So the And, and, and then the, the trailing apparatus behind that to carry away the the um the rock debris that's that's ground away as this as these machines chew their way through solid rock and all of that can can extend hundreds of feet behind the actual cutting face of the machine so you you talking about a machine that's like a huge a gargantuan extremely powerful um earthworm basically but it it bores its way through solid rock that's the basic um, tunnel boring machine and there, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of them being used all over the world. Uh, you could actually, if you have a half a million extra dollars laying around, you could probably buy a used serviceable tunnel boring machine off the in internet. <laughs> yeah, that is super interesting, man. Uh, are these, are these uh, bases connected in any way underground as far as you've seen, like with that type of uh, maglev technology or any type of rocket train? Technology? Well, 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 let me tell you, Greg, um, there are many stories about that, anecdotal stories that you will hear. And if you do a keyword search on the Internet, you can probably come up with some of these stories about high-speed maglev trains mm -hmm. and alien bases and connecting American military bases all over North America. What I can tell you from my research is that there was a... Uh, a concerted period of research in high-speed uh, underground vacuum tube tunnel transport. By vacuum tube, I mean tunnels, long tunnels, hundreds, even thousands of miles long, from which the air has been evacuated, essentially making a, an extremely long, extremely large vacuum tube. Now, why would you do that? Well, it's so that when you send a high-speed train through the vacuum tube, there's no air resistance, and it can go much faster using less energy. So once you built a tunnel, and it's airtight, and you suck all the air out of it, you could send, a, of course, a sealed um, train through there, sealed so the passengers won't asphyxiate in a vacuum. But a sealed train, you could send through it very high speed, with no air friction whatsoever. Now, the what pops up pops up again and again in the literature, and I, I discuss all this in my book, is the maglev technology, the idea that you would levitate the train cars, which would be spherical, on a magnetic field. And the magnetic field would be generated by um, electromagnetic coils that would be embedded in the floor of the tunnel. And you would have miles and miles of these uh, electromagnetic uh, coils as, as many miles as the tunnel is long. And they would create a magnetic field. And then the train would, would float on this magnetic field, you know, a couple of inches, three inches, whatever, yeah. above the, the floor of the tunnel. And then once you've started to pulse the magnetic field, these, these coils... Uh, uh, these electromagnetic coils buried in the floor of the tunnel, once you pu pulse the current through them, it would create a, a sort of magnetic wave, analogous to a wave on the sea, like surfers riding a cresting wave on the sea. Only in this case, you would have a train in a deep underground tunnel riding on a magnetic wave that would pulse down the length of this tunnel, and the train would ride that, you would pulse it as fast as you wanted the train to go. Now, this, do you, is that clear? Do you understand what I'm yeah, telling you there? Absolutely. I've, I've seen some futurists talk about it, but the idea that it's in existence now, that's pretty wild. Well, let's go back to the 1930s, to the Third Reich, because that's where it all started with a, a German engineer named Hermann Kemper who came up with this idea of the Rohrbahn, which is exactly what I just described to you. 
only he was prepared to do it with 1930s technology. Um, and he published some, actually got a patent, a, um, uh, a Reich's patent for it, and which I uh, mention in my book. And I also have some diagrams of his proposed um, underground high-speed maglev train tunnel network in Europe, connecting the major capitals of Europe, Kaliningrad, which is now in Russia, I believe, uh, Vienna, Paris, uh, Bonn, Berlin, Hamburg, Zurich, it would go all over Europe. Uh, that was his plan. And using 1930s technology, um, he was planning for a train that would go 600 miles per hour underground. Wow. Which is a speed, uh, which is faster than most commercial airliners travel today. So you understand that's like 80 years ago. And yeah. 80, 70 years ago, he was planning for that and writing about it openly, discussing it. Well, of course, World War II put an end to those plans, as far as I know. Or did they? And who would, who would know? Because at the end of World War II, so much about what happened in Germany and in the, in the 30s and 40s was classified. And a lot of it is classified to this day. So if he ever built anything like that, uh, it was kept um, deep, uh, uh, you know, a top secret uh, from that day until now. All right. The fact that starting in the, in the about the early to mid 60s and running up at least through the early 70s, but petering out, petering out by the late 70s, there was a lot of publicly um, published literature in the engineering, scientific, and military and government literature about building a very high speed um, tube transport system in the United States, city to city, intercity. Military agencies were involved, civil engineering companies were involved, non-military government agencies were involved, think tanks were involved. It was a very high level, serious uh, scientific and engineering um, research effort. There was a lot of time and money put into this. And then, Greg, it all went away. Hmm. Except that just a few years, I would say five, six years after, the, the literature trail ran cold. It just, it just all withered and died away. And that was when, by the late 80s, you started hearing rumors about a secret underground, very high-speed tunnel system. Isn't that funny? Definitely a correlation well, that's, there. Yes, that's what I think. So my guess is um, all of the noise died down to a whisper, an inaudible whisper, and they, they meaning the power structure, the big engineering companies, the military agencies, some of the other government agencies, and of course there would have been um, – Banks and financial institutions involved in, in this because carrying out a large, a huge engineering uh, project like that costs many billion, many billions of dollars. That is true. Hey, let me let me switch gears on you a little bit here. I want to talk about you know we talked about these tunnels. We talked about the finances that have uh, gone been funneled into the black budgets. I wanted to ask you about maybe what these tunnels can be connecting because we hear so much about these bases and as a show that handles a lot of fringe topics there's very few threads that make my mouth water like the stories of these stranger aspects that are going on in these underground bases i'm very curious i've also heard some rumors uh that go into the territory of saying there's full underground cities well let me tell you my research shows unambiguously that um the, the larger uh, of these facilities can accommodate thousands of people. So, yeah, they are. Uh, one example would be, one publicly known example would be Mount Weather, the big Mount Weather, the big FEMA underground base beneath Mount Weather in, in northern Virginia. This, this is outside of Washington, D.C. When mm -hmm. you start to get into the Appalachian Mountains, it's in the front range of the Appalachians, and, and that's actually was started back in the 1950s and is still a major, very large operational base for the United States federal government, and it can accommodate thousands of people. 
Um, so indeed, and it's way down there. It's um, the, the, the top levels of that base are like five or 600 feet underground. And then, of course, there's, it goes down deeper than that. So these bases can be very deep, very large, and they can accommodate not just scores, not just hundreds of people, but thousands of people living and working in them. So people need to uh, expand their mental horizons. And when I say, you know, that there's a, it's a different reality, it's like a, a parallel world, um, out of sight, out of mind. Right. I, I'm, I'm telling the literal truth. And when I say there are unknown thousands of people involved in building, maintaining, and operating, and working in, these facilities, I'm not exaggerating, and that's by thousands, I mean many, many thousands. Wow, this is almost like a breakaway civilization. It is, and, and people like Richard Dolan and Joseph Farrell and Catherine Austin Fitz have been talking about that, and, and I've been talking about the, that really myself for the last 20 years without having um, ever, ever specifically used that, that word, but it is, it's like a parallel reality and, and how can it be that you have so many thousands and thousands and thousands of people involved in constructing maintaining operating and living and working in these facilities and virtually none of them talk down to a man and a woman well it tells you that what is going on is really highly secret that it's um very important for the people who are engaged in it and that the penalties for talking must be extremely severe, right? Uh, such that virtually no, virtually no one does, and or if they do, they are shut up. Man, so of course they're trying to keep these things a secret. Have you ever been able to see beyond the veil to get any indication of what type of activities are going on? Because that's a lot of effort and energy to keep, obviously, some type of experimentation well, or something a secret. Well, well, let me tell you. Um, Sure, uh, and not all of these bases are secret. Some of them are, and my research indicates clearly that there are secret underground installations. Um, that's that's an incontrovertible fact. How many? I don't know. Where are they? I don't know, because they're secret, you see. That's very difficult to say. Right. Where are they and what's done in them there again? Um, you can't really say unless you're on the inside of those compartmentalized pro programs. And if you're on the inside, then you're in and you're not out. So you can't talk. And if you do, I guess there are enforcers who fix the situation so that you either don't talk again or you just don't breathe again. We, Like I, I, I said earlier, there's an entire parallel track of reality on this planet. And what's going on? Who's involved? All we can say is... Um, not much more than what I'm saying. We got trillions of dollars disappearing, um, just being sucked out of the of the global economy, the economy of the United States, but beyond that of the entire planet. Right. Trillions, Greg, trillions being sucked off into top secret programs. My research strongly indicates that part of that is the underground and undersea bases and tunnels. Yeah, interesting. Richard, you know, time is flying by, and there's so much I really want to ask you about. Uh, in particular, I know the people want to hear about some of the weirder aspects of these bases. I mean, we've had a lot of guests that talk about, like, the base in Dulce, New Mexico. Um, and all that's, that's propaganda. In my, Dulce, in my estimation, is, is um, propaganda, disinformation. Hmm. Interesting, because the main rumor there is is E.T. involvement. I was wondering if you've heard any stories of ET involvement at these underground bases that you think are credible? Well, I don't think the Dulce base stories are credible in that I don't think there is a base as the rumors and, and stories and legends describe at or very near the small town of Dulce, New Mexico, which is just south of the border with Colorado. Um, are there secret underground bases? Yes. Are there aliens underground? I believe there are. Um, are there joint alien, uh, top secret uh, American military programs or projects underground? I think the anecdotal evidence strongly points in that direction, yes. Um, is the Dulce, Dulce story as told true? I think it's highly probable disinformation.
if Dulce you think is misinformation, uh, that's totally possible. Are there what are some of the anecdotal stories that you do think have some credibility to them? Well, I think um, I discuss a, a few of them in in my book in the last chapter. Um, there's a, for instance, um, a base that has been described off the under sea off the coast of, of Puerto Rico, an underwater base, alien base. I'm inclined to uh, give that a a greater hearing because there has been a lot of reported UFO activity in the Caribbean area, including in Puerto Rico and in the 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 waters, uh, the seas around Puerto Rico. Um, also, for years, uh, the United States Navy had a, a station at Roosevelt Roads in, in eastern Puerto Rico. Uh, it was a, that region was a, a very high, there was a very high level of, of American um, U.S. Navy activity for a period of, oh, most of the post, post-World War II period until about 10 years ago. I think there's a reason for that. Um, another, another place where I think there's a high possibility of, of underground alien activity would be off the coast of, of California. Linda Moulton Howe describes in one of her books, which I cite in my book, an anecdote um, from one of her informants, of um, being taken to such an undersea base, where, which, by the way, uh, very much resembled the entrance to which very much resembled the entrance uh, technology of of the rock site base technology that I discuss in my book, leading me to wonder if maybe it's not a an American Navy undersea facility um, that's off the coast of California in the Channel Islands region that has uh, an alien presence. Um, these types of stories. So those are two examples right there that I would lend some credence to. Hmm. And then and then uh, the Southwest region in general, there are a lot of videos and there's a lot of noise on the internet about the the uh, United States military having, having um, shot down and or recovered, crashed UFOs in some cases with their occupants dead and other cases with live occupants, of course, Roswell figures figures uh, very large in this scenario, but not only Roswell. And in my estimation, Los Alamos itself uh, would be the, the site where one or more of these aliens would have been kept quarantined. Interesting. And, and obviously, it, there is going to be a lot of disinformation around such a high-priority topic. And, and mean, let me tell you something else, Greg. There are a lot of disinfo agents within the field of ufology. Yes. And this has been going all the way back to the 1940s, uh, especially starting in the 50s and 60s. There were a lot of people involved in ufology with connections to the United States military and espionage agencies. There still are. And also in the remote of the field of remote viewing, um, many of the prominent names in remote viewing, the field of remote viewing, either were in the past direct employees of military or espionage agencies or have close ties with people who were. Mm -hmm. And it's just the reality. Once you get in to these areas that the powers that be prefer that the people know little or nothing about, you start running into individuals with connections, both formal and informal, to intelligence, espionage, and military agencies. That is the reality. Yeah, it definitely is. But um, so let's get to some truth or, you know, maybe more just your belief structure. But you said that you believe that there probably are some uh, ET bases like you described. What would you assess well, as the another, ET another, landscape well, in regards well, another, to working uh, with people? Uh, another, another anecdote I give from my book is, is, is I mentioned um, a uh, first person account of an individual who was abducted, and of course, that there are more and more abductees every decade. There appears to be a lot of this going on, uh, apparently with the connivance of shadowy elements of the United States government and military. But this particular uh, 
man was taken to uh, an underground facility and intrusive medical examination was performed on him. He was in something that resembled a medical school amphitheater. And he was being worked on by, by aliens. But he also saw perfectly normal appearing terrestrial humans with them. So it was a joint alien human operation. That's interesting. And he, yes, well, I mentioned this in my book. And, and he asked, um, because he was, of course, traumatized and surprised and puzzled, all of that and more. And so he, as this was going on, asked, you know, where am I? And he was told, you are in uh, an underground base in southeast Kansas. And as he was told that, he got a telepathic vision of being in a deep underground base in southeast Kansas, beneath the Kansas landscape. And, and then he said, well, why? And he was, uh, he was told, well, uh, an important procedure is being performed on you uh, that could be for the benefit of you and other people. Um, so he was their lab rat, in other words. And the, the thing that impressed him was, number one, the, the facility and what was happening to him clearly was astonishing. And, and then beyond that, the fact that, you know, hey, there's, there's aliens and they're working on me. But you know what? There are people here, too, with them. So I have some of those stories in my book. And I accept that this is going on. I accept that this is part of the underground and underwater basis scenario. Uh, there's, a, there's just a real bizarre aspect of it. I also was contacted by an engineer who's spent his career working in these facilities, the, the really secret ones. And he actually, frankly, confessed to me that he had amnesiac blocks in his memory. There were things he couldn't remember that had been just weren't there. Uh, missing, missing episodes and periods. And this is another thing that pops up is um, the mind control aspect of this alternate reality. We are so deep into this simulated artificial virtual reality, man. This whole planet is rigged and controlled. Yeah. We're like we're like in a Hollywood, a high budget Hollywood sci-fi production. It's like the whole planet is that way. Mm -hmm. But what he told me was that... Um, and he told me, you know, like in California, Colorado, Nevada, different places, um, there are these very deep, very large, extremely sophisticated, technologically cutting edge manufacturing facilities that the um, military industrial complex has established such that if civilization, so-called civilization, is destroyed, they have the capability using what's underground to make whole cloth from beginning to end, a functional automobile, uh, a functional uh, jet airplane, or, or a train locomotive, or a, a microwave oven, or a television, a tabletop radio, a cell telephone, you follow me, mm -hmm. to reconstruct, to reconstruct industrial technological civilization, start from zero and start it all over again, without having to have a 5,000-year cycle of development, starting with, well, we'll rub these two sticks together and make a fire. They don't want to go back to that point. So if they blow up the entire world with nuclear war, or there's a pole shift or, or asteroids, whatever, that one or more of these bases will survive and that they will jumpstart technological industrial civilization, like basically from a say, from a mid-20th century, late 20th century, start. So it's like, you know, no sweat to them. They'll n knock it all down, destroy it all, and start it all over again on their terms. Um, and mm -hmm. the other thing he described to me was, um, and I've never seen this in the, in, in the, in the open literature anywhere, and some, and some of these bases, as he described to me, have entrance tunnels that may be 20, 30, 40, 50 miles away from where the base itself is. Interesting. Now, another area now, I wanted to ask you now about. Now, there's another ask. Yes. One more, one more thing he told me, and this gets into the question of, of cyborgs, which has been discussed a lot in science fiction literature and science fiction films. And more and more we see discussion, the open literature of marrying uh, DNA to electronic circuits or wiring computers right into human brains. Right. Uh, now, 
he he has memories of working with what in vets with what to him resembled large like a slabs of of animal protoplasm like a, a side of beef yeah in a vet in a vet but on the side of of the beef would be a keyboard but it was like a futuristic sci-fi kind of keyboard in which his hands and his fingers would exactly fit and he was either programming the side of beef or in some kind of connection with the side of beef doing and this is where his memory blanks out he he can only remember it doing it more than once this was work he did and he's an engineer but he can't remember more than that oh man that is weird i i wonder if that has anything to do with the stories you hear of cloning or human animal hybridization going on far more than that my guess would be and i and i ran across this in some of my research back at at at, at oak ridge uh, national laboratory this was already back in the 1990s they were doing research where they would attach gold electrodes to dna molecules and the idea was to um have an electrical, uh, electronic contact between the DNA. In other words, they needed to have an electronic contact between the DNA and a computer, a supercomputer mainframe, um, so that you could either decode or read what was in the DNA or program the DNA. Wow. So my guess is that my guess is they're well beyond that. Probably creating their own uh, DNA and programming it to do. God knows what. And that could be done on a nano level, yeah, a that's, microscopic level. That's scary stuff, man. Uh, have you heard any of those stories, or do you put any stock in the stories of human-animal hybridization at these underground facilities? Yes, I do. What can you tell us about that? That sounds super interesting. Well, w what I can tell you is uh, what I know from the open literature, that, that research in human-animal hybridization has been, and, and not only that, but um, transgenic hybrid. Uh, uh, biological engineering has been going on uh, at least since the 1990s. And my guess is extending all the way back to the World War II period. Um, I think the Japanese and the Nazis were involved in this and probably the Americans too, at least since the 1930s and 1940s. In other words, I think the announcement by Watson and Crick of their discovery of the DNA molecule uh, was probably a in a sense, the disinformation, too, and that um, the public announcement of it probably greatly lagged behind what was being done secretly by a period of years or decades. Yeah. Um, and it's also true that the, um, the Department of Energy of the United States is the lead agency on this planet for um, research into the human genome, human DNA. Now, you would think it would be the Department of Health or, or I don't know, some major biological research institute. No, it's the Department of Energy. I'll tell you their, their, their public rationale for doing that. The public rationale is after World War II and the explosion, the first few um, atomic bombs, it was realized that, um, that um, radiation has a, has a um, detrimental effect on DNA, on genetic material, so they needed to research that, and that's why they're so heavily involved in researching human DNA. That's the cover story, and there's some truth to that, no doubt about it. I believe the deeper reason is that, essentially, um, the most powerful energy in the universe is information. Mm -hmm. um, energy, at its essence, is information. And when, you, when you're dealing with, um, for example, uh, supercomputing, which the Department of Energy is massively involved in as well, um, you, you're doing nothing but uh, transfer of information. It's the transfer of information uh, that precedes the employer release of energy in all cases. Mm -hmm. And... Early on, I think they realized the hype, when they began doing DNA research, the, the hyperdimensional quality of the DNA molecule. And when you're talking about the engineering of hyperdimensional um, realities or merely accessing hyperdimensional realities, you were talking about 
the release or access to stupendous energies of all kinds. Right. Imaginable, imaginable and unimaginable. So you see, the DNA molecule is a hyperdimensional molecule. The Department of Energy is the lead agency on this planet into cutting-edge research into not only human DNA, but DNA in general. And so what I'm telling you is when you get into the realm of working with and through DNA, you open the doors to the magical kingdom within, <laughs> to the to, to universal uh, whatever, knowledge, power, information. Uh, there's just no end. That's what I'm telling you is just like a, a Alice in Wonderland reality that we're dealing with here. And it's not, it's not, and for that reason, this, this keeps popping up again and again in the underground basis, this re biological engineering, genetic engineering, cloning, hybridization of humans and animals, and, and beings in vats am, full of amniotic fluid being cloned, and you run into this again and again and again. I have just read and heard these stories again and again. I believe that at least some of them certainly must be true. Man, that is fascinating. There, there is another area that I wanted to ask you about. There's a lot of speculation about wild things going on in secret chambers under the pyramids of Giza and the Giza Plateau in Egypt. Are you able to shed any light on what might be going on under the surface there? First of all, uh, what you see in Egypt today are the highly, highly eroded and ruined remnants of a majestic civilization that existed there thousands of years ago. Pharaonic Egypt, in other words, dynastic Egypt, that for mainstream historians and Egyptologists uh, begins about 4,500 years ago, um, or at the most 5,000 years ago, is just a remnant, a remnant, as magnificent as that was, right. just a remnant of what went before, according to my research and my understanding. Um, because there was, before this dynastic Egypt that we know from our history books, another even more magnificent civilization. Uh, how far back that goes, I don't know. Having been there twice, my feeling is it goes back at least 10 or 15,000 years and maybe 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years. When I first went and I stood there and I looked at the Great Pyramid, just looking at it, immediately I knew everything I've been told in the history that I learned in school and that I've read about from mainstream Egyptology. Whatever the truth is, they're not telling it. Hmm. Because once, once I just had a body knowing that, no way, whatever, there's, whatever they say happened, it's, it's not that way. It's far older, far older, and how, however they say it was done, it wasn't done that way. And beyond that, it's true. There's quite a lot underground. When I studied Arabic, uh, I studied Arabic for a year, beginning Arabic, when I was doing my uh, PhD. And my instructor was an um, uh, Egyptian military intelligence officer. So I asked him about the pyramids. At that time, I hadn't been to Egypt. And I asked him about the pyramids. I said, is it true that there's something underneath them? And he said, yes. And I said, well, what? And he said, well, there's just, there are just multiple levels, uh, miles of tunnels and chambers under the Giza Plateau. And this is my first time hearing that. And I was, it kind of rocked me back on my heels. And I said, well, really, has anyone explored it? And he said, sure. And I said, well, who? I said, well, the, he said the Egyptian army has been all through there, sent their uh, reconnoitering teams all through there. And then uh, locked it all off and blocked it all off with, with armed guards. And so I've subsequently learned and read and spoken with other people. And indeed, that's true. There's quite a lot beneath the Giza Plateau. Um, what you see topside is part of it, but there's more beneath. Well, why doesn't mainstream Egyptology say much of anything, if anything, about what's beneath? It's because there's a cover-up, Greg. It's a thousands of years long cover up about not only Egypt and Giza and what not only what's below the ground but what's inside in detail other chambers in the in the major pyramids um, 
This whole planet is involved in a, a cover-up. This whole planet is a black operation. There's just disinformation everywhere. Yes. So, so what I, everywhere, up, down, and sideways, and we don't even know the planet that we're living on. People think, well, I live on Earth. I, I pretty well understand what's hap- happening here. No, you don't. <laughs> you, yeah. don't know one per- you don't know one percent of what's happening here. And yet we all, well, I don't say we all because I don't anymore, but I would say the vast majority of people walk, up, walk about just automatically assuming that they know what's happening, and they don't. So anyway, the um, stories about uh, things underground in Egypt, oh, hell yes. I mean, there's an awful lot underground in Egypt. What do you think they're trying to hide? Previous technological civilization, man. Yeah. What, are there any details you can give us about what they might have found down there? Well, what I've been told on the QT is that, um, well, what you can read, and you can even find some of this on the Internet, is that the Arab historians, which are very little listened to or studied in the Western world, uh, Indian historians aren't either, I mean from India, but the Arab historians, and even more so the Indian historians, have quite a lot to say about previous cycle of civilization or civilizations which were very advanced in the in the, in the case of, of Egypt this one of the stories that the Arab chroniclers have left us down through the centuries is that uh, there was a huge global cataclysm approaching and of course people who study this now realize that there have been a repeated series of global cataclysms over a very long period of time mm-hmm. but evidently this is the most recent one, or one of the most recent ones. There was a king named King Saurid, and this was many thousands of years ago. He learned uh, through his seers that there was a huge cataclysm that was going to um, just pummel the earth in the relatively near future, in a period of years, and it was going to be absolutely globally devastating. If I had a guess, it would be that destruction of Maldic that they probably observed and there was a lag time before all that debris from Maldic, Maldic being the planet that used to exist between Mars and Jupiter mm-hmm. and exploded thousands of years ago evidently in interplanetary warfare. People can read the books of Joseph Farrell or go online and read the Ages of Eurus, U-R-A-S, um, Anton Parks, A-N-T-O-N, last name P-A-R-K-S, People can Google his name. Um, he has some information about that. Uh, Joseph Farrell has written about some of these things and, and others. But my guess is that there was this interplanetary warfare, and with the destruction of Maldek, they knew all of these debris from this exploded planet would come down the gravity well from half a solar system away and blast the Earth. And so he gave orders to have the Great Pyramid constructed as a repository of all of the wisdom and knowledge of, of the world at that time. Hmm. And, and it was done. His, his name was King Saurid, S-A-U-R-I-D. And this was done. And the Arab chroniclers have kept this story down through many centuries. The Western historians, I've never heard it mentioned until I did my own independent research. But if you go and you actually read uh, the dynastic succession uh, the kings before the deluge, the kings before the deluge, some of them had fantastic lifespans and reigns, thousands of years. Then there was the deluge, and everything changed. Afterwards, people became more normal, like we know them today. Now, it's interesting that on the Great Pyramid itself, when in the medieval period, when, when, people, when the Arabs finally broke in by brute force, uh, clearly there are secret entrances to the Great Pyramid. Uh, from underground, for example. But when the Arabs broke in from above ground with brute force, they found in the passageways inside the Great Pyramid, like, you know, 150, 200 feet up, thick encrusted salt, hmm. uh, which would be would be consistent with the sea having covered that area at one point right. in the past. And then as, as the sea subsided, uh, there would have been a lot of evaporated salt left behind that was in the seawater. And there's other evidence in Egypt of, for example, the oasis of Fayum, 
which is now um, out in the desert, south southwest of Cairo, of Giza. Uh, it's a good two or three hour drive. Um, there's an oasis out there, but it is a landlocked arm of the sea. In the past, uh, the Mediterranean Sea extended down there, and um, it doesn't today. You see, it's all over the thousands of years dried up. So in the past, thousands of years ago, the geography of that region was far different, far different, looked far different, different vegetation, different landscape, the waterways, everything was just 100, 180 degrees different than it is today. Now it's just sand and desert from horizon to horizon. Mm -hmm. was, not, was not that way 10,000, 11,000 years ago. Interesting. That also brings to mind another non-mainstream story from the ancient past that you've talked about, which is the Hopi. Don't they have a pretty interesting story about visiting beings from a tunnel system on the earth in the past? Yes, the Hopi, um, in, in the last, when the Great Deluge happened, when there was the last great planetary catastrophe, the Hopi say that they went and lived underground in, in the southwest United States with the ant people for a period of time until conditions on the surface were once again conducive uh, to human life. And they, they came back out onto the surface through like a, a cave opening or a hole in, in the ground and, and now live again on the surface after having spent a, spent a period of under, time underground, underground, mind you, with the ant people. And to this day, the Hopi, if you talk to them, not what you read in books, but if you actually go and live in the Southwest, as I did for many years, um, I lived out there for eight years, including in the region near, I, I studied at the university in Flagstaff and, and lived outside of Flagstaff. And I knew some Hopis and, and talked a little bit with them about the uh, previous centuries and thousands of years. The Hopis, the Hopi went walkabout as a people. And they literally walked thousands of miles um, from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, is my understanding, and all points in between. This was their task given to them by the Creator because they are caretakers of the earth. So they literally had to physically walk their garden that they're taking care of, so to speak. And then they came back to the southwest region. And one of their stories, and, and as they came back to the southwest, some of the different pueblos that you see in the southwest, at Mesa Verde, for example, in Arizona, at um, Walnut Canyon, um, uh, different, different Chaco Canyon, different places in New Mexico, different places where you have these ancient pueblo dwellings, their oral history, that they, their private oral history, is that they would go and live at these places for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and then they would be told to move, and they would go to another place, and lived there 50 years, 100 years, and then they would move around like that until they finally settled at the Three Mesa area where they are now. Their last stop before the Three Mesa area was at Wupatki, which is in, in between Flagstaff and the Three Mesas in northwestern Arizona. At Wupatki, there is a, a ball court, of the, which is a, of, of the style, you know, in, in Mesoamerica, from Central America up into the southwestern United States um, centuries ago, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, there was a ball game that they played where the player, the male players used the kind of heavy rubber or leather ball and they, they booted it with their hips through hoops that were at the ends or sides of the ball court. This game is not played anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, that is the most northern known ball court in, in the uh, Mesoamerican ball playing region. Um, there at Wupatki, and right beside the ball court, there is a hole in the ground where the wind is always blowing in or out. It's an entrance to a vast underground cave system right there. Wow. I've gone many, I've gone many times. It depends on the air pressure. When there's low air pressure, the air blows out from underground. When there, when there's high air pressure, the air blows into underground, and I mean days on end. Um, and the story of the Hopi is that um, there's an underground area there where they lived. And when they came out, they came out in a hole on or near the side of the Grand Canyon. And that's the story. I believe it's true as told. 
Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm always fascinated by those old stories of intelligent species that are might not even be human that are from within the Earth. Uh, there's a lot of yes. old cultures that talk about that. It's a really interesting thread. Well, I don't think that the so-called terrestrial human race is the only uh, technologically capable or intellig so-called intelligent species on the Earth. Uh, there are a lot of stories about uh, large intelligent insect beings, large intelligent reptilian beings, um, and you even run into some stories about other intelligence as, as intelligences, as in um, uh, was it uh, Ionis, who was the the fish man who came up out of mm. the Persian Persian Gulf and brought civilization to the ancient Sumerians and Babylonians thousands of years ago, um, and of course there are stories of these aquatic um, aquatic humans. There are many stories about uh, the mer people, mer meaning sea, mm -hmm. the sea people who live underwater. Uh, there are many stories from many um, cultures around the world of mer people, human beings who live underwater, or human-like beings who live underwater, and also, uh, surprisingly enough, there are even some modern-day sightings from time to time of mer people, so I don't rule out at all that there could be aquatic, one or more aquatic species of humans or human-like beings. Yeah, I, I am really curious if there's any ongoing communication with these species, maybe in secret, because it just seems like a wealth of well, I think potential. So. I, and... think, I think so. I think so. I think at the least probably the Russians and the Americans have communication with them and and um, but you have to understand that this regime in Washington, D.C. right now is so evil and it's got its tentacles everywhere. Of course, it has allies in Wall Street, Wall Street, uh, the city of London, Tel Aviv, Herzliya, uh, uh, different places. It's a, an evil uh, neocon Zionist um, bankster right. cabal that they're taking. Frankly, Greg, they are taking this planet down. Um, they, they, they have a, a pronounced self-destructive, auto-destructive, self-destructive uh, impulse, and they're leading us. We already have Fukushima and Chernobyl. Now, now they've taken us to the brink of a shooting nuclear war with the Russians. And, I mean, how much worse can it get before it's over? Right. That's the million-dollar question. Because the direction we're headed right now is an extremely dark, negative destructive evil direction i mean we could name reef deforestation the the great forests in asia and africa and latin america are being cut down the great tropical forest the seas are being poisoned we have exploded melted down nuclear power plants we have um uh, a, a a global financial system based on the united states dollar that is self-destructing uh we have uh, a, a nato um uh, Pentagon military machine that seems to to do to be doing its best to egg the Russians into a a shooting nuclear war. I mean, how far can this go before it just self implodes? Right. It's self it, self destructs. So there's constantly people talking about you know the collapse is coming and you know we well, seem to be all, getting closer. But, but, and closer. but Greg, Greg, it's it's not coming. It's here. Yeah. It's collapsing now. I'm telling you that because of Fukushima, the Pacific Ocean is dying now. Because of the insane financial policies of the United States Federal Reserve Bank, the global economic order is collapsing now, and it's causing tremendous hardship. Half of humanity lives on 2 or $3 a day. Half of the human beings on this planet live on 2 or $3 a day. Now, you, you tell me how that doesn't represent global financial collapse. We, right. We're talking... We're talking desperate suffering now by half of the human race. And the other half are looking over their shoulder, shoulder, wondering, is that going to be me tomorrow or next week or next month? And the answer is maybe. The way things are going could be. Things are definitely bad. And, I mean, based on these old stories of other species interacting with humanity, I mean, this seems like the prime time because they generally come around near a giant global collapse you know when they try to pick well, all, us back can, up off our off our destructive tendencies all i can tell you is that the so-called with a heavy 
emphasis on so-called ruling elite on this planet. They are psychopaths. They are demons in human form. They are incompetent. They are ignorant and also extremely arrogant and violent. It's the worst of all possible combinations. Enormously ignorant, enormously arrogant, enormously violent, and incompetent beyond words to describe. It's just a tremendously dangerous combination. And that's, that, that's our situation. I totally agree with you there, and I know we've run a little long. I wanted to ask you about one other thing, uh, yes. something you had written about on your blog. You had mentioned that you had been shown uh, a timeline of ET disclosure that that runs all the way up to like 2070, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I, I can tell you. Um, I was shown a, a timeline of the 21st century. This is some years ago with a, a special emphasis on on extraterrestrials and their interaction with this planet and our interaction with them. Now understand, extraterrestrials are, are there now, they're here now. There are other planets with civilizations on them and there have been for millions and billions of years. What I'm talking about is the opening of global mass society to these realities. The reality already exists. What doesn't exist is a mass awareness on the part of global humanity of the reality. For whatever reason, we have been put in a total state of, of ignorance and amnesiac forgetfulness and kind of sealed off from the rest of the galaxy. I don't know why, but we have been mm -hmm. for thousands of years. And what I was shown is that as this century progresses, that is going to change. Exactly how it's going to change and who's going to do it and what their motivation is, I can't speak to that. There are many, many players and actors, both on the part of extraterrestrials. There are myriad extraterrestrial civilizations and factions with, with, with many different motivations and agendas. Just as on this planet itself, there are many different power factions with different motivations and agendas. So however that power faction aspect of it works out, I don't know. But what I was shown is that Generally, between now and about 2020, 2025, for all I know, it could happen this year. But over the next 10, 15 years, 10 years, say, there'll be more and more of an awareness of life on other planets and other civilizations such that it won't be viewed as strange anymore. It'll be more and more viewed as Oh, yeah, you know, everybody knows there are other planets and there's life on other planets. And, hey, you know what? There, there's ET civilizations on other planets. That'll be the first step. And we're, we're part, part of the way there already. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are more and more people with that kind of knowledge now. But it'll get to the point where it'll be, you know, universal, where 90% or 95% or more of the average human being in, you know, Botswana or, or, or Paraguay or wherever will say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I heard about that. You know, that's true. Um, that's true. I, I heard something about that last year, that uh, there are um, people on other planets. Um, yeah, it's it's tr weird, man, but, yeah, evidently that's the case. That'll be the stage, okay? Yeah. So just, to, just about everyone will reach that point. And then beyond that, as we move deeper into the century, say uh, by mid-century or before, uh, there will actually be open contact with these civilizations such that civilizations one or more such that there would be something like an exchange of ambassadors or guests or the, I, I, I don't have a precise word to describe what I'm trying to um, to convey to you but that there will be um, you know one or more of earth humans going there one or more of them coming here but it'll be done openly Hmm. Uh, integration. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's happening. Well, no, not on a mass societal basis. There'll be representatives, uh, small numbers of representatives. It'll be more like diplomatic exchange or very limited cultural exchange or scientific exchange or anthropological exchange or whatever word you want to give it. But it'll be a, it won't be, there won't be like space liners carrying 300,000 people from <laughs> Earth to there and vice versa. I'm not talking about that. Be on a, but it'll be to the point where people will say, oh, yeah, you know, I heard about that, and, and we sent a representative over there. You know, crazy, man, that's 300 light years from there. But, uh, yeah, we sent a representative there, 
and it may even be like on network television or the internet or whatever and that'll that'll happen very publicly and openly i believe that that's happening secretly and has been for for decades but it'll be open to the public and then by such it most everyone will be aware of it and then uh, and that'll have a tremendous effect culturally and socially uh, spiritually and in, in, in every every respect and then later in the century after mid-century rough of the period 2060 to 2075 thereabouts um, there will be um, something like commercial exchange trade relations established but understand I don't think there will be like um, freighters full of petroleum going to Alpha Centauri <laughs> or or you know, um, or 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 six hundred million tons of of gold ore and things like that. I believe the trade would involve things like um, art, probably art or um, flora and fauna, maybe genetic protoplasm, DNA, mm -hmm. um, things like that, or or certain isotopes uh, on Earth, minerals, maybe mineral samples. Uh, beautiful examples of of gems and things like that that aren't are unique to earth you know every planet is different and yeah. so but but what would be what would be important to another race another species of life another civilization on you know another arm of the milky way galaxy i don't know you see they're alien they're different so right. i i couldn't say and and vice versa what of theirs would it would appeal to us and have great cachet or importance? Um, so I think there would be um, there will be a tremendous uh, leavening effect here. It will cause tremendous uh, ferment and growth in human society and, and human mentality. And and so in general, these will the trajectory will be in that direction as the century unfolds. Now, for us to realize that. We have to survive as a species. And if we don't get nuclear technology, number one, under control, we are done for. Right. Because it will, it will take us down. We, we can't handle Fukushima now. And what happens? Chernobyl was bad enough. Now we have Fukushima. What happens when we have Chernobyl, Fukushima, and another one, and another one, and another one? You see, if that keeps happening, we're done. And in fact, if we don't re resolve Fukushima, we still may be done. So, for in order in order for this reality to unfold, we humanity must have a global racial awakening, and we have to utterly, completely reject nuclear technology at the least because we can't handle it. Yeah, that is fascinating info, and I hope that we live to see that day. Uh, can, can you tell what the source was for that timeline? Me. My consciousness. Oh, it came to you like it, it was revealed to you in visionary form. Ah, like a uh, psychedelic Interior. type of. No, not psychedelic, as in a direct visionary transmission of information. Interesting. In other words, my own consciousness, my hyperdimensional aspects of my own being, and I'm not presenting to you or pretending to you that I, I alone, uniquely, am able to do this, or I'm having telepathic visionary downloads of information lots of people are oh yeah yeah um, and and it's unique capacity of human beings this integration of the dna and the consciousness and the physical realm um, we have these multi-dimensional hyper-dimensional aspects any individual can access this if he or she wants to most people do not want to mm -hmm. yeah yeah we've been down that road before and that's an interesting topic as well. But I know I've taken up a little bit of your time more than more than you had expected. But so that pretty much does it for us, Richard. It's been a fascinating conversation. I always love hearing about what's going on at these secret locations. It's just so hard to know what's the real deal. And I wish I could better understand the ET human partnership that seems to be a big factor in it. But I really appreciate all your work. Uh, would you like to tell the folks about what you're working on next or your website before I cut you loose? Well, my website is eventhorizonchronicle.blogspot.com. That's eventhorizonchronicle.blogspot.com. And I believe you have a link up to that. Yes. And, and I've, I've been doing some work with Bitcoin recently. Um, uh, me too. 
not not just because um well i can exchange some links with you later if you don't mind sure but um, not just because it's a it represents a way to generate some income which it does and it has earned me a little money but because i think that the cryptocurrency technologies not just bitcoin but there there are many others there's litecoin there's dogecoin and there's just a whole feather coin there's there's a bunch of them that are coming out ethereum is a new one um the the whole suite of cryptocurrencies may be beyond central bank control yeah beyond national and that they i believe potentially nothing is for sure unless and until it is self-realized actually realized but potentially this cryptocurrency technology represents a liberate econ, means of economic liberation if not for all of humanity at least for a lot of humanity and as i mentioned earlier we have at least half of the human race that is just suffering in tremendous financial poverty and my my vision is that the cryptocurrencies with the development of mobile phone technology and some other technologies can penetrate these desperately poverty stricken communities all over the world yes and uplift them a lot of times they're stuck within a currency within a government uh that's you know, like you said impoverished and bitcoin allows those people to partake in a economic structure that's beyond that and i think it is the most potentially yeah it's potentially the, it is potentially and, the only the only thing i see that could get us beyond the control of the banksters. So I get really upset when I see people being super cynical about it because I'm like, if you're going to be cynical about Bitcoin, then what? give me some other option because this is the best source I see for potential freedom. Listen, if they're so cynical about Bitcoin, why do they have a bank account? Why are they carrying around a wallet or a purse with folding paper money? Why do they have a credit card? Because if you want to be cynical about economics and so-called finance, then why would you even be associated with this corrupt banking structure we have now? Amen, man. Hey, well, thanks again. It's been a great show. I've had a great time talking to you and making your acquaintance. Keep doing what you do, man. Hopefully we can have you back in the future. Thank you. I appreciate it, Greg. Best of, best, best of everything to you. All righty. Take care, Richard. Richard Sauter, ladies and gentlemen. I thought I'd